Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Actually, I foolishly deleted the video files that I taught at Sunday Bible study on my Revelation verse by verse commentary. So, unfortunately, I cannot retrieve those video files. The backup and everything is gone. So, what I'm going to be doing is just simply teaching through this video screen. I hope you can put up with that one. I actually did not want to do this teaching, but I know that there are people who want to know verse by verse in Revelation and not, and not miss out a single verse study. So because of that, for your sakes, uh, I decided to do this video, and I hope that you will nevertheless enjoy it despite of no drawing in this video. So let's return to where we were supposed to leave off in the video playlist. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I notice I've been getting a lot of comments on that. Just simply go to our video playlist and you'll see commentary on Revelation. Commentary on Revelation video playlist and you can find out all the continuous videos that talk about the end times revelation studies. All right, so returning to where we left off would be verse 14. It says, And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. All right, what this is basically saying, let's go verse by uh, word for word and the fruits that thy soul lusted after. Okay, so that is a English metaphorical phrase that you'll notice is commonly used throughout the Bible. Whatsoever thy soul lusted after, or the goods that thy soul lusted after, etc., etc. Basically, that's an old English phrase referring to whatever you want. Now, notice why I said in the modern English is whatever you want you whatever you want you is referring to the soul actually and then in this english phrase what you've got to understand is the real you is the soul that's the reason why that old english phrase is you and the fruits that thy soul lusted after because the real you is not your body it's actually your soul i mean when you die where do you go in the grave or are you in heaven or in hell see that so that's why the real you is referring to the soul notice it says the fruits that thy soul lusted after so it's referring to edible fruits obviously so it could be an apple orange grapes etc lusted after meaning whatever uh, it's referring to want want and desire lust so that's the idea, and the fruits that thy soul lusted after is an old English phrase. Now, there's a doctrine called spiritual circumcision that I won't really talk about because some of you have already heard that in several other videos that I taught. But the short version is that before you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says that when you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, God cut off your body of sins from you. Meaning then that your soul is separated from your body of sins. That's why your body of sins have no effect on your soul, and your soul can go to heaven after you die. Because why? Because God did that spiritual circumcision, that cutting off. So before you were cut off then, in other words, before your soul was cut off, then that means that your soul was stuck to your body of sins before you got saved. Oh, then that makes a lot of sense that when sinners commit iniquity, it makes sense they go to hell after they die because whatever they sin in their body attributes it to the soul. Whereas for saved people, when they sin in their body, it doesn't attribute to the soul. Why? Because Jesus Christ cut it off, spiritual circumcision, based on his work on the cross. So, 
the phrase and the fruits that thy soul lusted after, old English phrase, it might sound like whatever your carnal desires, whatever your body wants. But remember this, the soul is connected to the body. They're very interchangeable. So that's the reason why the soul would be connected to something fleshly, some fleshly desire here at this verse 14, at verse 14. However, based on spiritual circumcision, we are separated from our body of sins. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, it is very sad that whatever our body desires to do, the soul will follow after it, doesn't it? So even though the soul is no longer part of the body, a lot of times we, aka soul, we decide to follow whatever the lust of our flesh want rather than the fruits of the spirit. But anyways, uh, that should explain everything on the English phrase over here at verse 14. Now, a lot of this chapter is going to contain English metaphorical phrases. So I'll just continue on. Are departed from thee. So the fruits that whatever they desired was is gone from Babylon. And all things which were dainty and goodly. So anything out there that's like dainty, goodly. So it sounds like a delectable. It sounds like an, something edible, right? If you look at nice chocolates, for example, we could call it dainty and goodly, etc. That's the idea. So all these m delicious meals, basically, at verse 14, are departed from thee. It's gone. It's separated from them. And thou shalt find them no more at all. They cannot find it anymore. They cannot find it anymore. Verse 15, the merchants of these things. So the merchants who are responsible for shipping, importing, and selling these delectables, these edibles, which were made rich by her. So they're made rich by Babylon, the great whore. That's what her is referring to from the context that you might recall in our previous videos, verse by verse. Shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment. So these merchants are far away from Babylon burning because obviously they don't want to be caught in the torment, the burning of Babylon. So they stand afar off. They're far away out of fear of Babylon burning, being tormented, weeping and wailing. So now they're weeping and they're wailing. That's self-explanatory. Far away. And then verse 16, this is what they wail and cry out while they're far away, while Babylon's burning. And saying, what do they say? Alas, alas. Now, uh, that's an old English phrase, again, that's commonly used. Now, alas is like the hymn we would sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, for the hymn at the cross. Alas, the watered-down, dumb English version, so to speak, so it doesn't really do it uh, an accurate translation justice, but... The modern dummy version, that way onliners can understand plainly, is that it's basically, oh my, oh my. That's the idea for alas. Uh, people today, unfortunately, take God's name in vain. Oh my, G-O-D, right? Whenever something bad happens. So that's the idea with the old English phrase, alas. Now it's repeated twice, alas, alas, and that's commonly used as English phrases, such as verily, verily. You might have noticed that phrase in the King James Bible. And the idea of it is repetition stresses the importance. Shakespearean English and literature, whenever they repeat these words, it shows the weight and stress of importance of the word in the English language. Unlike modern English, who deems repetition of words unnecessary and takes them out, if you were to actually look at the most powerful English language, the, the most authoritative English language, it is not our modern English. It's so watered down, it chops off a lot of words because we just want a shortcut version of words. But old Elizabethan English, Shakespearean English, is the best English language ever by uh, that is recognized by any English scholar. Now look, I've 
transferred to Berkeley. I got accepted to Berkeley, which was known as number one during my year in the English department, actually. So I took some English classes, and they admitted that as well, that Shakespearean English is that rich. It's the best English language. So, alas, alas, is a, such an appropriate wording that flows with the richness of English language that God has used to stress also the importance of repetition. So in Mark chapter 9, when Jesus repeats three times, where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched, if the NIV and modern English versions... See, modern English, not old English, not rich, powerful Shakespearean English, but modern English versions of the Bible, they took off, they subtracted that verse, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. They only mention it once, not three times. So that, uh, that weakens, that takes away the power of repetition, repetition that God deems important. Okay, back to our main text. Alas, alas, that great city. So the merchants remember they're away, far away, and they're crying out, weeping, oh my, oh my, that great city. So Babylon's a city, it's a great city, that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now think about it, what city is mostly known for being clothed, receiving the clothes of fine linen. The colors are purple, red. They have uh, decorations, they're decked. They wear gold and precious stones and pearls. Why? That is the Vatican City. That's self uh, that should be plainly seen over there. I mean, you're not going to think United States of America the clothing that's mostly represented by the city is the Roman Catholic Church, Vatican City. Verse 17, for in one hour, so the merchants are wailing that within this time span, one hour, which I do not think it is a literal man, uh, human standard time of hours. I believe it's more of a biblical prophetic clock, and I mentioned that to you before in our previous Revelation studies, which I won't expound here. So they're wailing that within one hour of time, so great riches is come to naught. So Babylon's great riches is what? It's all gone. It comes to nothing. That's what that old, again, an old English phrase, is come to naught, is referring to. It just comes to nothing. It's all gone. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Okay, so notice over here that Babylon is known for its navy, its shipping, etc. Every shipmaster, so shipmasters, all the company and ships, so ship companies and sailors, sailors, and as many as trade by sea, those who do trading through sea, stood afar off. They're also far away weeping and wailing about the destruction of Babylon. So uh, some people assume that this would be United States of America because America would be mostly known for worldwide trade. However, some of these people who are infatuated with America being Babylon, they don't realize that Italy is also known for being one of the top places in the world that does worldwide trade, shipping. Verse 17, you'll notice that because it discusses about shipmasters, company, and ships, sailors, many that trade by sea, that why not Rome? Why not Italy? Be qualified. Why can't Italy be included in this? Why does it only have to be America? By the way, another problem for the people who insist Babylon is America is we cannot deny verse 16. 16, that fits Rome much more than America. And not only that, if we were to think from all the verses that we discussed in our Revelation study, Revelation 17, Revelation 18, about a city that has religious power and political power in the whole world, if you're going to think of one city that has that, in politics, economics, religion, 
etc., etc., what is it? It's obviously the Roman Catholic Church Vatican City. Not only that, in the context of Revelation 17, 18, it's a sin for people to be joined to the business economics of Babylon. Now, if we insist that's America, then that means 99, if not 100% of safe Christians have sinned because we're all working in jobs in America. It makes more sense if we were to say that you're part of the job system if you're working for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, that would make way more sense, wouldn't it? So, in context, not only that, it mentions about Revelation 17, 18, Babylon being known as the Mother. Now, what city is known as Mother Church, Holy Mother? By the way, Babylon, it goes all the way back to Nimrod and Semiramis. Uh, United States of America, the only way that you can tie her to uh, Babylon is just the woman figure, the Statue of Liberty. But with Nimrod Semiramis, who started the Babylonian system, it's not just the woman, it's a mother and child. Not just, uh, not just drop the child and look at the mother. I mean, you can find billions, uh, excuse me, but you can find lots of cities around the world who can qualify, who can find a mother figure anywhere. But when you put a mother and child together, I mean, the candidate list just goes even smaller. And we can definitely see that this is referring to Rome here. Roman Catholic, there is absolutely no doubt. Okay, continuing down, verse 18. So remember these merchants who do trading by sea, they're far away and cried when they, smoked, when they saw the smoke of her burning. Okay, so they saw the smoke of Babylon burning up. They see the smoke coming out over there and cried saying, What city is like unto this great city? They cry out, what city is like this great city, Rome? A lot of people, you can imagine, are going to cry out like that as well. Because think about one of the top places where people would want to tour around the world. You would hear a lot of people talking about Rome as part of that touring list, wouldn't you? So, because it has so much history, so much splendor, etc. Now, notice the phrase, the smoke of her burning. It sounds like hellfire, so to speak. It matches kind of with Romans chapter 14, the smoke of their torment, the smoke of her burning in this verse. So just remember that. It might come out to some really interesting doctrine later on that I'm going to point out. Verse 19, and they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing. So notice over here when they were crying, weeping, and wailing that they would put dust all over their heads, so to speak. Now, this can come down to two interesting interpretations here. One, again, because there's so much English metaphorical wording over here, that this can be the same thing with verse 19. They cast dust on their heads. It's an English metaphorical phrase just simply referring to their so much in grief. That's the idea. Now, remember the Apostle John he what he is unable to write modern English words, for example, cars and uh, airplanes. So the Apostle John would just word it as, uh, excuse me, but f the, in Matthew chapter 24, it would word it as flight. And then John would be referring to it as a chariot. And then Malachi and Joel is very plain, I think, where it talks about, plowshare, swords, and uh, spears, and pruning hooks, etc., concerning about the battle of Armageddon, when the unbelievers try to go to war against God. Now, obviously, that's not their kind of weaponry during Armageddon, pruning, horse, uh, pruning hooks, spears, etc., etc. It's going to be referring to guns and machine guns and rifles, etc. That's the obvious weaponry they're going to use at the battle of Armageddon. But the apostle during that time, they had to use the best wording that was available to them for weapons. And their best modern weaponry during their time was that one's spears, swords, etc. Not AK-47s or bazookas or tanks, etc. 
<laughs> Same thing with over here at Revelation 18, which I mentioned briefly last time at verse 13 about chariots. Why, that's not the vehicle that's modern during John's time. The vehicle modern during his time would be chariots. That's the best way he can describe it in a modern way. Compared to ourselves, in our modern times, the modern word would be for vehicle would be cars, etc. Okay, so that's what this verse 19 could be referring to. But there's a second interpretation because the rule of in biblical hermeneutics interpretation in the Bible is that you take the Bible literally as it says unless it's impossible or not likely from the context. Now, from the uh, we notice over here that by context in, of verse 19, they cast dust on their heads. That's why we can include a metaphorical phrase. However, it is actually very possible. It is actually very possible. It doesn't make it impossible. It's very possible they can cast dust on their heads during this time. You might say, why? Because, remember, the Antichrist... He is going to be a Syrian Jew. Now think about the cultures of those two nationalities when they're in grief. Would some of the people, not all, but would some of those people cast dust on their heads when they're overtly in grief? How about that? Not only that, the Antichrist system is going to be a Jewish system because he wants to imitate God. He's going to take over the temple in Jerusalem I mean, if he's going to reinstate Jewish sacrifices, is it so far-fetched to say he will reinstate Jewish customs, especially that he wants to deceive the world, saying, hey, I'm Jesus Christ, so I am restating uh, the Jewish customs and laws, proving that I am your Messiah. Hmm, that's something to think about. Okay, and cried, so while they're weeping, wailing, they cried out, saying, what did they say? Alas, alas. That great city, that's self-explanatory, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea. So everyone was made rich in the shipping business from Babylon, the great city, by reason of her costliness, based on the fact of the costliness, the price, the monetary value that they gained through their shipping business from this great city. For in one hour she made desolate. So in this span of time, one hour, she's just desolate, gone. She's just gone, emptied out like that. Now notice that word made desolate. Sometimes that phrase can be a reference to hell. You'll notice that. Destroyed, desolate, emptied out, etc. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes it doesn't. I recognize that. But sometimes that's used as a reference to hell. So let's just hold that thought.